Welcome back to another episode of Mike Reads. Tonight we'll be continuing in our series on Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson with a read in Chapter 3, The Blessings of Destruction. As I've mentioned in previous videos, we're doing this as part of a parallel read with Thomas Sowell's Economic Facts and Fallacies by Request. Um, so I'll link to that series in this video's description. Also, as previously mentioned, after each read, I'll be doing an analysis or, and review of each of each read so that you can better understand the read that we've actually done and the material and within the read and to get an understanding of how I've interpreted all of that. Um, I'll post, of course, I've in the con in the description of this video, I'll also have timestamps so you can just jump to the analysis if that's what you want or to when you get to the analysis, st uh, skip to the next uh, skip to the next read entirely. If you don't want to hear the analysis. Um, so without further ado, let's dive right on into uh, Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson with Chapter 3, The Blessings of Destruction. So we have finished with the broken window, an elementary fallacy. Anybody, one would think, would be able to avoid it after a few months' thought. Yet the broken window fallacy, under a hundred disguises, is the most persistent in the history of economics. It is more rampant now than at any time in the past. It is solemnly reaffirmed every day by great captains of industry, by chambers of commerce, by labor union leaders, by editorial writers, and newspaper columnists and radio and television commentators, by learned statisticians using the most refined techniques, by professors of economics in our best universities. In their various ways, they all dilate upon the advantages of destruction. Though some of them would disdain to say that there are net benefits in small acts of destruction, they see almost endless benefits in enormous acts of destruction. They tell us how much better off economically we all are in war than in peace. They see miracles of production, which it requires a war to achieve and they see a world made prosperous by an enormous quote-unquote accumulated or backed-up demand. In Europe, after World War II, they joyously counted the houses, the whole cities that had been leveled to the ground and that, quote, had to be replaced, end quote. In America, they counted the houses that could not be built during the war, the nylon stockings that could not be supplied, the worn-out automobiles and tires, the obsolescent radios and refrigerators. They brought together formidable totals. It was merely our old friend, the broken window fallacy in new clothing, and grown fat beyond recognition. This time it was supported by a whole bundle of related fallacies. It confused need with demand. The more war destroys... The more it impoverishes, the greater is the post-war need, indubitably. But need is not demand. Effective economic demand requires not merely need, but corresponding purchasing power. The needs of India today are incomparably greater than the needs of America. But its purchasing power, and therefore the quote-unquote new business, that it can stimulate are incomparably smaller. But if we get past this point, there is a chance for another fallacy, and the broken window whites usually grab it. They think of purchasing power merely in terms of money. Now money can be run off by the printing press. As this is being written, in fact, printing money is the world's biggest industry if the product is measured in monetary terms. But the more money is turned out this way, the more value of any given unit of money falls. This falling value can be measured in rising prices of commodities. But as most people are so firmly in the habit of thinking of their wealth and income in terms of money, they consider themselves better off as these monetary totals rise, in spite of the fact that in terms of things they may have less and buy less. Despite, in spite of the fact that in terms of things, they may have less and buy less. Most of the good economic results which people at the time attributed to World War II were really owing to wartime inflation. 
they could have been, and were, produced just as well by an equivalent peacetime inflation. We shall come back to this money illusion later. Now, there is a half-truth in the backed-up demand fallacy, just as there was in the broken window fallacy. The broken window did make more business for the glazier. The destruction of war did make more business for the producers of certain things. The destruction of houses and cities did make more business for the building and construction industries. The inability to produce automobiles, radios, and refrigerators during the war did bring out a cumulative post-war demand for those particular products. To most people, this seemed like an increase in total demand, as it partly was in terms of dollars of lower purchasing power. But what mainly took place was a, was a diversion of demand to these particular products from others. The people of Europe built more new houses than otherwise because they had to. But when they built more houses, they had just that much less manpower and productive capacity left over for everything else. When they bought houses, they had just that much less purchasing power for something else. Wherever business was increased in one direction, it was, except in so far as productive energies were stimulated by a sense of want and urgency, correspondingly reduced in another. The war, in short, changed the post-war direction of effort. It changed the balance of industries. It changed the structure of industry. Since World War II ended in Europe, there has been rapid and even spectacular quote-unquote economic growth, both in countries that were ravaged by war and those that were not. Some of the countries in which there was greatest destruction, such as Germany, have advanced more rapidly than others, such as France, in which there was much less. In part, this was because West Germany followed sounder economic policies. In part, it was because the desperate need to get back to normal housing and other living conditions stimulated increased efforts. But this does not mean that property destruction is an advantage to the person whose property has been destroyed. No man burns down his own house on the theory that the need to rebuild it will stimulate his energies. After a war, there is normally a stimulation of energies for a time. At the beginning of the famous third chapter of his History of England, Macaulay pointed out that, quote, No ordinary misfortune, no ordinary misgovernment, will do so much to make a nation wretched as the constant progress of physical knowledge and the constant effort of every man to better himself will do to make a nation prosperous. It has often been found that profuse expenditure, heavy taxation, absurd commercial restriction, Corrupt tribunals, disastrous wars, seditions, persecutions, conf- conflagrations, inundations have not been able to destroy capital so fast ex- as the exertions of private citizens have been able to create it. No man would want to have his own property destroyed either in war or in peace. What is harmful or disastrous to an individual must be equally harmful or disastrous to the collection of individuals that make up a nation. Many of the most frequent fallacies in economic reasoning come from the propensity, especially marked today, to think in terms of an abstraction, the collectivity, the nation, and to forget or ignore the individuals who make it up and give it meaning. No one could think that the destruction of war was an economic advantage who began by thinking first of all the people whose property was destroyed. Those who think that the destruction of war increases total quote-unquote demand forget that demand and supply are merely two sides of the same coin. They are the same thing looked at from different directions. Supply creates demand because at bottom it is demand. The supply of the thing they make is all that people have, in fact, to offer in exchange for the things they want. In this sense, the farmer's supply of wheat constitutes their demand for automobiles and other goods. All this is inherent in the modern division of labor and in in, in an exchange economy. This fundamental fact, it is true, 
is obscured for most people, including some reputedly brilliant economists, through such complications as wage payments and the indirect form in which virtually all modern exchanges are made through the medium of money. John Stuart Mill and other classical writers, though they sometimes failed to take sufficient account of the complex consequences resulting from the use of money, at least saw through the quote-unquote monetary veil to the underlying realities. To that extent, they were in advance of many of their present-day critics who were befuddled by money rather than instructed by it. Mere inflation, that is, the mere issuance of more money with the consequence of higher wages and prices, may look like the creation of more demand. But in terms of the actual production and exchange of real things, it is not. It should be obvious that the real buying power is wiped out to the same extent as productive power is wiped out. We should not let ourselves be deceived or confused on this point by the effects of monetary inflation in rising prices or quote-unquote national income in monetary terms. It is sometimes said that the Germans or the Japanese had a post-war advantage over the Americans because their old plants, having been destroyed completely by bombs during the war, they could replace them with the most modern plants and equipment and thus produce more efficiently and at lower costs than the Americans with their older and half-obsolete plants and equipment. But if this were really a clear net advantage... Americans could easily offset it by immediately wrecking their old plants, junking all the old equipment. In fact, all manufacturers in all countries could scrap all their old plants and equipment every year and wreck new plants and install new equipment. The simple truth is that there is an optimum rate of replacement, a best time for replacement. It would be an advantage for a manufacturer to have his factory and equipment destroyed by bombs only if the time had arrived when, through deterioration and obsolescence, his plant and equipment had already acquired a null or negative value and the bombs fell just when he should have called in a wrecking crew or ordered new equipment anyway. It is true that previous depreciation and obsolescence, if not adequately reflected in his books, may make the destruction of his property less of a disaster, on that balance, than it seems. It is also true that the existence of new plants and equipment speeds up the obsolescence of older plants and equipment. If the owners of the older plants and equipment try to keep using it longer than the period for which it would maximize their profit, then the manufacturers whose plants and equipment were destroyed, if we assume that they had both the will and capital to replace them with new plants and equipment, will reap a comparative advantage or, to speak more accurately, will reduce their comparative loss. We are brought, in brief, to the conclusion that it is never an advantage to have one's plants destroyed by shells or bombs unless those plants have already become valueless or acquired a negative value by depreciation and obsolescence. In all this discussion, moreover, we have so far omitted a central consideration. Plants and equipment cannot be replaced by an individual or a socialist government unless he or it has acquired or can acquire the savings the capital accumulation to make the replacement. But war destroys accumulated capital. There may be, it is true, offsetting factors. Technological discoveries and advances during a war may, for example, increase individual or national productivity at this point or that, and there may eventually be a net increase in overall productivity. Post-war demand will never reproduce the precise pattern of pre-war demand. But such complications should never divert us from recognizing the basic truth that the wanton destruction of anything of real value is always a net loss, a misfortune, or a disaster, and whatever the offsetting considerations in a particular instance can never be, on net balance, a boon or a blessing. All right, that concludes the read in Chapter 4. On to our analysis and review. All right, on to the analysis and review side of the video. This one should be fairly short because there's a lot that he brings up, but we're really only going to focus on the main point of the article. So before we actually get into the main point, let's just breeze through the ancillary things that he brings up, uh, such as the inflation and monetary concepts and that the fact that supply begets demand. This is, these are actually true. Everything he says about this is correct. However, he goes into far greater detail on this. 
um, in, in the later chapters. And for the sake of this this chapter, really that's not the point that you really need to get out of this chapter, especially when he's going to go over that and further demand. Um, it's true about what he says about the accumulation of capital and savings. Thomas Sowell is actually going to go into more detail on that and economic facts and fallacies. So again, check out that series. Link is in this video's description. If you want, really want to get into that, uh, Hazlitt does go through the accumulation of capital and savings. Um, what, where it's probably actually a better resource would be would be the history of currency um, in in Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations. So I guess I'll, I'll put a link in this video's description to that series as well. Book one of that of Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations goes into great detail about the history of currency, and it uh, it makes the point pretty evidently clear that that Hazlitt is making here about the accumulation of capital and savings. Uh, but like I said, mo for the for the reason the reason we're going to breeze through this is because uh, Hazlitt goes into this uh, in later chapters in far greater details, and it's not really the message that he's trying to to deliver with this chapter. Um, the concept of need versus demand is something that I think probably needs to be touched up on at least, because I don't think it does a very great job in this chapter of actually explaining this. So in this case, what he's talking about with wartime is that you, in the case of need versus demand. Uh, when you have, he's he's not saying that there is a need for a thing that therefore is a there's demand for the thing. So if we're talking about grain, there is going to be a demand curve you can build for grain. Uh, therefore, there is demand for grain. It's a product that we would consider uh, fulfilling a basic need. However, what he's talking about is something like in the case of war, the reason you go to war in the first place is because you have to. You're not doing it because under normal circumstances, you would do that thing. Uh, so in the case of war, we all accept that there are going to be tremendous costs to going to war, including human costs, like the cost of lives. Uh, but we choose to go to war for non-economic reasons. We choose to go to war because there is an end that we must strive towards. That's the only reason we do that. If we had in the United States today, if for God forbid... That China decided to instill a mainland invasion of the United States, we would say, whoa, okay, drop everything, grab a gun, and start the wartime production. Divert all of those resources we would normally put into much more self-evidently productive means and work us towards that war effort. Yes, we're going to have to tax the crap out of everyone, but not because it's something that is an, a reflection of that mutually bene, uh, mutually consensual exchange, that mutually consensual transaction, but because it was something that had to be done. If there are, if there, you know, we talked about Farmer Brown and we talked about Farrier uh, Smith. I went into greater detail on my series on interference in that respect. Um, so again, I guess I'll have to link to that again. Uh, in this video's description, so you guys can check that out. But the point is that the level of demand for, say, polos is just going to shift to, say, camouflage shirts, right? So the same money spent on this is going to be the exact same money spent on those things. And as we explained with the broken window fallacy and with Adam Smith's realization, Adam Smith's... Uh, idea that mutually consensual transactions are uh, self-evidently and axiomatically beneficial to both parties because you wouldn't engage in them unless you thought you were getting more than what you were surrendering. The idea here is that if you didn't have to go to war, you wouldn't buy the camouflage shirt, you'd buy the polo. Because to you, the, even if it's the same dollar cost, even if the polo is 20 bucks and the camouflage shirt is 20 bucks, you see the 20 bucks that's in your hand is going further when you buy the polo in, in, in non-war situations, which means since you're not bringing war upon yourself, right? Since you're not engaged, if you're not starting the war, then you obviously believe you would rather be in a state of peace than in this a state of war. Um, this is what he. This is why uh, Hazlitt refers to this as a diversion in demand, not a creation of new demand. 
So he talks about this on page 27. But what mainly took place was a diversion of demand to these particular products from others. So this book was written in 1946 in the immediate aftermath of World War II. So he's talking about during World War II. But what took, mainly took place was a diversion of demand to these particular products from others. We built tanks instead of automobiles. If we didn't have the war, which is easily avoidable, right, by people not engaging in war, in, in efforts that require war, right, if we had not engaged in that, that war, as we hadn't been for a few decades prior, then we would have built automobiles instead of tanks. Instead, the exact amount of uh, purchasing power that we had for those automobiles was just shifted. Just take from here, move to here. The people of Europe built more new houses than otherwise because they had to. But when they built more houses, they had just that much less manpower and productive capacity left over for everything else. So that's what he means when he says that. Um, there is a uh, desperation productivity levels. So when, you're, when you have desperate times, desperate times call for desperate measures. Out of desperation, people will do things uh, that they wouldn't normally do. Um, so out of desperation, say in post-war Germany, they would build faster than they normally would because they had to. Uh, this is, uh, and the example I'll give you is driving fast to a late job interview. So you getting from the point of, let's say you need to shower and get changed, that shower you're going to take before that interview that you're running late to is going to be the fastest shower you've ever taken. You driving like an animal to get to that interview, I mean, that's happening because you have to, not because you actually want to. Right, So it's not you saying that we should drive fast. It's not you saying that I should engage in three-minute showers or two-minute showers. It's saying it's you doing this two-minute scrub down real quick and get out of the shower because you have to, not because you think it's the right thing to do. So the point that you should get out of chapter three, though, is what we're going to spend the rest of this time on. And I realize that I'm over eight minutes now, so I'm going to try to make this as quick as I can and try to get myself under at least 12 minutes. All he's doing in this chapter is doing what I was start touched up on when we in our last read with, in Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson, which is just simply taking the broken fallacy to its logical end. Like if it's okay, if it's a good thing to smash one window, why not smash all the windows? And while we're at it, why not smash all the walls, roofs, floor tiles, etc., and all the equipment in these buildings? Well, obviously, well that's what he's talking about. When we have total war, and we have what he was talking about in the case of World War II. This is not an example of a slippery slope. This is a, a reality. This is taking a, a, an argument to its logical end to see if the argument actually stands up to being taken to its logical end. And, and it's not, in, in addition to not being a slippery slope, this is why I consider the slippery slope fallacy to be kind of a BS fallacy. Um, so like I said, why not break all the windows, all the roofs? How would The idea he's bringing up is Although we have abnormal productivity, say, in, in the case of World War II, how would people have spent that, those resources otherwise? Would, have they, would they have saved up their money towards other means? Or would they have just spent, 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 spent because we have this existential, life-threatening situation that we have to endeavor into? How would people have spent their money, spent their time, and, and exhausted their resources if it weren't for the war? What would they have spent their money on? The same thing is true with the, the, the generic broken window fallacy. Uh, and it's there's also the fallacy that he brings up of the time and money devoted to research. Yes, during World War II, we had a tremendous explosion in technology. Well, what was the technology and what resources did we expend in order to get that technological advancement? Now, everyone agrees that, and this is, this is a risk evaluation that you're going to have to make, how much time, how much energy, how much money are you willing to put to get these technological advantage, advance, advancements? In the case of, for example, the cure for cancer, how much would you spend to obtain a cure for cancer? Would you spend every dime and every asset every human being on earth has today and bombard us effectively back to the Stone Age to get a cure for cancer? How much, would, how much value would having a cure for cancer be when... You know, if you're only going to, if you're going to save a few thousand kids every year from childhood leukemia, right? We have a cure for cancer now. We're going to save a few thousand kids a year from childhood leukemia. If you're going to have to sacrifice hundreds of thousands, if not millions of uh, infants due to malnutrition, 
Because now malnourishment, of course, in the ancient times was rampant. And that's why infant mortality rates were what they were hundreds of years ago. So the answer, of course, is that, well, no, obviously we're not willing to spend that, that amount of money. So these are risk calculations that we do every day. And this is what he brings up with, with uh, war. Um, let's see. I'm just reviewing my notes here, folks. You'll have to bear with me. Yeah, so in addition to the money sacrificed, is it worth, in addition to the idea of is it worth it at all, what is the particular advancements you're going to get? And if you don't have these wartime advancements, maybe we don't get certain certain uh, advancements in firearms. Maybe that those advancements in firearm technologies go towards other things that, again, outside of wartime would be significantly more productive. The other thing is that, and if, if we're going to, and I, what I like to do with these reads is to take the read and apply it to something you might see today. So all of those shopkeepers, all those homeowners that had their money, had their buildings destroyed during the war, how would they have spent their money had it not been for the war? Now, after the war, they obviously have to spend their money bu building these houses, building these shops. Obviously, they would not have spent all of this money repairing, completely building their houses from nothing. Obviously, they're making the decision that they would rather have their houses in whatever state they're in and not just have their houses destroyed and started over, even if the new house they get is better. And this is axiomatically true by virtue of the fact that, for example, they're not burning down their own houses. Uh, as, as Hazlitt puts it, yeah, as Hazlitt puts it, no man burns down his own house on the theory that the need to rebuild it will stimulate his energies. And this is why the notion that, oh, they have insurance on that home or, bu or building or, or shop, so screw it, torch it, right? That's not what insurance is there for. Insurance is just a deferral of risk, and you pay a monthly premium to defer that risk. Now, if there were other means of deferring that risk, Obviously, people would engage in that. And the other thing, too, is if the risk is one, how on earth is that a business model for the insurance company? If, if, you, if, the insur if, if that was actually what people believed, if people believe, if the shop owners and the, if the shopkeeps and business owner and homeowners, excuse me, believe that it was more valuable to have the money from the insurance claim than to have the house and pay the monthly premiums, what they would do is burn down their own buildings. And this is true in the case of a riot. The fact that people aren't burning down their own buildings suggests that they would rather have police come in and enforce the law and get rid of the damn rioters than have to make an insurance claim. That's not what insurance is there to do. And on top of that, if that were the idea and everyone was just constantly burning down these buildings, the, the, you wouldn't have insurance because there's no way to build a, 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 a business around a model of just giving money away. Not to mention that the premiums would increase. And this is why you see flight from high crime areas. Because the insurance, and this is because the cost to do, of doing business, which include insurance premiums, where, you're, where the risk of a building being torched is much higher, is so much, is so great that businesses flee these areas. Homeowners flee these areas. So, you know, if we were to extrapolate that to an advanced example that we see today, no, it is morally obviously beyond reproach, and nobody agrees beyond, with, the, with the notion that, oh, they have insurance, it's okay to torch their building, because it's not okay. The shopkeep is making it axiomatically true. And even the people doing the torching, why aren't you torching your own homes? Why aren't you torching your own apartment? Well, there's insurance on all of that. Why don't you destroy your own facilities? The fact that they don't means that this is not only a terrible argument, it's not one even being made in good faith. And again, this is even true if the new building or a piece of equipment is made, is actually better than the one that it replaced. As uh, Hazlitt points out on page 29, um, it is sometimes said that the Germans or the Japanese had a post-war advantage over the Americans because their old plants having been destroyed completely by bombs during the war, they could replace them with the most modern plants and equipment and thus produce more efficiently and at lower cost than the Americans with their older and half-obsolete plants and equipment. 
But if this were really a clear net advantage, Americans could easily offset it by immediately wrecking their old plants, junking all the equipment. In fact, all manufacturers in all countries could scrap all their old plants and equipment every year and erect new plants and install new equipment. So in the case of, say, the local landscaper who has a lawnmower that he loves, let's say it's one of these really high-end uh, zero turns. They, typically, these things cost like $14,000. So two things to point out very quickly. If in the, at the end of the year, the mower still does what, it, what he needs it to do, why is he throwing it out? Why is he scrapping it? Why is he spending money on a new mower that's going to not do anything that the mower that he's got isn't allowing him to do. And, and it may be that the new mower has, say, a more comfortable seat. It may be that the new mower, say, has a bigger deck. Well, if he doesn't really need the bigger deck, if he doesn't really need the, the, the new seat, maybe he wants those things. Maybe those things are, are good things. But the fact that he's not throwing out the old mower and getting the new one for the new seat is an indicator that he would rather have the money and the older lawnmower than have the newer lawnmower. Even if that means he could sell the old lawnmower and get the new lawnmower for not $14,000, but maybe, uh, you know, 75% of that because he can maybe get 25% um, and a trade-in or something for the old lawnmower. So I hope that makes these points clear. Uh, we'll continue on in our next read in, in Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. Uh, with chapter four, which is public works means taxes in our next read within Henry has its economics in one lesson. So until then, this has been Mike signing off.